So this is a spectrogram. Just kidding. It's actually a drawing I made of a spectrogram. It's a very versatile tool used in all kinds of sound related fields, such as live sound engineering, linguistics, music production, even ornithology. These are used quite often to track bird calls. You'll notice though that I didn't mention personalized voice training. Why is that? Well, let's get into it. Firstly, I want to discuss what a spectrogram is. Not because you need to know, but because we're going to be discussing the pitfalls of using them. So some understanding is going to be pretty helpful for us to talk about literally anything. I'll do an abridged version here, but there will be a lengthier version on the Patreon cut of this video. The abridged version is that we have our high frequencies up at the top, our low frequencies down at the bottom, and we have time moving left to right. And then we have a heat map showcasing intensity. By the way, I'm using the Music Lab spectrogram. I really like it because it's got this 3D effect going on alongside the color mapping, the heat mapping. Um, the link will be in the description. That really thick line at the bottom, that is the fundamental frequency, which is our first harmonic, which we typically perceive as pitch. There's a trans voice lessons video that goes far deeper into what a spectrogram actually is. I would recommend that. It's gonna be in the description. Let's get into three ways in which this tool right here can be misinterpreted. Brightness is a term that in sound refers to the amplification of higher frequencies. For instance, between a trombone, and a flute, the trombone would be the brighter sound. It's a lot buzzier. You may have heard brilliance being used as a positive feature in voice training, specifically when referring to our resonance. I personally believe that this term being used for resonance is misleading and antiquated. I'll put it to you simply. What sounds more feminine? a clarinet or a trumpet? My guess is that most of you would have answered the clarinet, which has dampened overtones at its highest frequencies compared to the trumpet. Now in vocal femininity, when we're talking about that buzzy, brassy sound quality, we're actually talking about vocal weight, the heaviness or lightness that we perceive in a voice. Uh, uh, that's vocal weight. Any descriptor of vocal size or resonance as a sound getting brighter only works if the weight is staying consistent, which is not the case in typical male and typical female voices, of which typical male voices are heavier and typical female voices are lighter. Ooh, all the change is really happening in the mids here. The highs are changing, the formants are changing, but they're not getting more intense. That's the important part. It's all staying relatively blue as opposed to See how there starts to become some green up there. There starts to become some some warmer colors. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, we want a little bit less bright spectral content and all the brightening should actually be in the mids. Ooh, ah, notice here there's some brightening going on there. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. So if you're using a spectrogram, don't think that your goal is to make the highs of your voice way more intense because that is actually going to make your voice heavier. Size change will be a brightening most notable in the mids, but again, only use this as an additive tool to the changes you're already hearing with your own two ears. Okay, so trying to boost our highs gives us heaviness. What does trying to cut our lows do? Could it be the key to a feminine voice? Well, that's where we start to run into the issue of strain. When we try to choke out the low end, we get a labored, stretched, kind of effortful quality that we perceive as not quite natural. For strain, we're going to be looking at this bottom line, the fundamental frequency. Strain and weight oftentimes are pretty closely associated, so you might see some change in the higher spectral activity as well, but we're going to be focusing on this bottom line. Oh, notice how it goes from red to orange to yellow to green up here at the very strained part. Hello, red. Hello, 
green. Didn't even change my mic position. I didn't get further away. That's just what it does when you're doing strain. What I'm getting at here is that above all else, for a voice to sound naturally feminine, it really needs to sound balanced and unforced. Otherwise, it will start to sound atypical. Not necessarily masculine, but atypical, which is just as much of a category to watch out for. I always come back to this mantra, voice training is not a process of increasing the effort in our voice, but it's actually a process of decreasing the amount of effort in our voice. And that extra effort oftentimes materializes as strain. For this section, we are going to be analyzing voiceless size scales, which can be very useful for exploring resonance. A voiceless sound is a sound that uses breath rather than voice. Whispering is a great example of a voiceless sound. But if you're not using your ears and you're just using your eyes, the spectrogram can be very misleading during this experiment. Changing the vowel identity only can give results that might look like size change, but really you're just going from an O oh to an E. If you're doing a breathless size exercise, first of all, make sure you're not using so much force that your sound starts to become constricted. We are not endorsers of big dog, small dog on this channel for that reason. But secondly, make sure that the vowel identity stays the same. Notice how we did get some higher spectral activity, but didn't it also sound like I was changing my vowel more so than my size? Going from an O to an E back to an O? Compare that vowel with this when we're trying to keep the vowel a little bit more consistent and changing the size instead. The largest and the smallest sounds should both sound like the same vowel. I want to make something very clear about spectrograms. They don't give you access to any information that you do not already have with your two ears. There's a reason most of them cap at 20,000 hertz, which is the natural human limit for hearing. They are graphic representations of our own hearing, and it's easy to fool yourself into thinking that just because it's real, calculated, objective data, that it's more important than fuzzy, raw, subjective experience. That is a fallacy. The sounds that you hear firsthand should never be devalued to the second rung of vocal analysis. It should always take top billing. You learn sound stuff through sound, not graphs, not even written language, but through sound first and foremost. More important than what you saw in these changes is what you heard in these changes. The sound of buzziness or the sound of strain or the sound of different types of vowels. That is way more important than what you see on a chart. Thank you all so much for coming by. Subscribe to Vocal Team, join us on Patreon, and sign up for voice lessons with me and Ken. The Vocal Team Discord server is free and has a variety of free resources available for voice training. So please join us there. Thank you to all of our patrons. Special thanks to Trans Voice Lessons and Vox Nova for their incredible work on perceptual voice training learning. That's all I got for you this time. Thank you all so much for coming by. These things are just so fun to look at. Like... <laughs> Vibrato is really fun on these. That's a good one. That's a good line. You see that? Put that in your video.